I think we uh, left off uh, last time with uh, projectile motion, is that right? Yeah, and we're, we're looking at this whether you're thinking about the trajectory or uh, motion of a, uh, a golf ball or a water balloon, baseball, tennis ball, or you can get into uh, uh, military uh, cannons, things like that. They, they follow these same, same rules. And we, uh, we looked at this scenario where you were firing something off with a, a velocity v naught that was some angle from the horizontal phi, and we could break that up into v naught cosine phi for the horizontal velocity and v naught sine phi for the uh, vertical velocity. And then I better check, make sure, I'm, did I, am I recording this? I think so, yeah, good. Okay. So, we had uh, derived last time the, uh, the the height of this at the apex at its highest point was equal to v naught squared sine squared phi over 2g. And then we had the total time. We just finished up as we were finishing last time that the time from a to c was equal to 2 times v naught times sine phi over g. And we have left to figure out what the, the range is. So one thing I want to talk a little bit about with the range is the acceleration in the horizontal direction. If we look at the acceleration here, we're going to say that the acceleration here is equal to zero. Okay, uh, So that's going to neglect uh, air drag. We've, we've talked about that before. If we were talking about firing a feather, this is probably not a very good approximation. If we've got a uh, relatively low speed cannonball or something like that, it's probably a pretty good approximation certainly makes our uh, math easier. If we start looking at uh, drag, we've got to look at fluid models and uh, differential equations and things like that. So we'll go ahead and take the acceleration in the horizontal direction as zero. So if I want to look at the range, then I can go back to our equation that distance is equal to rate times time. Okay, and we could say then the distance, the, the range, so the uh, range that this is going to cover is going to be equal to the rate. Well, if we look at the rate, we've got v naught cosine phi, v naught cosine phi times the time. Well, we said it's going to be in the air for this long. That's why we did had to do the uh, the time there first. So we'll have the um, did I get that right? I hope so. Yeah. So we've got uh, two times v naught times sine phi divided by g. Okay, And we could uh, reduce this if we wanted to. We could say that this was uh, v naught squared times 2, or maybe I'll say v naught squared divided by g. And then I'll have this uh, 2 times the cosine of phi times the sine of phi. And if you've seen these equations before, a lot of times these are some equations they'll put down in, in formula and act like they were, are mysterious. In fact, at GE103, I think we use these equations, and I said the derivable. We just chose not to derive them at that point, but uh, we're deriving them now. So you can see they have a, a, a rational derivation. One thing that we're going to have to do is you probably don't recognize this uh, cosine phi and sine phi. So if we use the uh, trig ID, so trig ID that the uh, sine of 2 alpha is equal to 2 times sine alpha cosine alpha. So looking at that, we really have the right-hand side of that trig ID up there, and we could say then, and they're writing all over on this, but I want to save the upper right-hand corner for you. We could uh, write this thing as R is equal to v naught squared times the sine of 2 phi divided by g. Okay. So we've got the uh, height, we have the time, and here we have the uh, range r. v naught squared times sine of 2 phi. That's not sine squared, that's sine of 2 phi times g. Well, let's look at the units on that, do a quick units uh, calc here. So if I look at the uh, units on v naught uh, squared, that would be feet squared per second squared using an English unit. And then sine of 2 feet does not have any units, but g does. You're going to have feet squared per second squared, and you end up 
with uh, you end up with a problem. Ah, I don't have squared here, do I? Okay. Uh, maybe I'll try and tidy this up a, with a, a little better. Look at that went right away. Okay, so now I have feet per second squared for g, so I get to cancel these two, and I get to cancel one of those with one of those, and we end up with feet, which is what we would expect. So those are the the equations, the equations for h, the equation for time, the equation for r, and we saw those actually in GE 103, but we, we now derive those, so you, you can use those. One thing that we talked about is we wanted to maximize r. So let's say that we go up here and we want to maximize r. So if you're using a cannon or something, if you can get more range out of it than your enemy, uh, that's a good thing. So you can sit back and pound on them. Um, and let's let's see how we can do that. If I have the expression for r, so I'll repeat that up here. We'll say that uh, r is equal to v naught squared times the sine of 2 phi divided by g. And I think I'll go back and use my calculus. Whenever we think of minimum or maximum, you might think of math, what, 251, differentiation. So I'm going to say that I'm going to take the derivative dr with respect to d phi. You might say, well, what about v naught? Well, obviously, the more velocity we put into this thing, the, the, the further it's going to go. So probably the real question is, is what angle gives us a, a maximum range? So when we go through this, this uh, v naught and g is really acts like a constant. So I'm going to have uh, v naught squared over g times the uh, cosine of 2 phi times 2. And then uh, by the chain rule, that's where the uh, 2 came from. And then I'd really have, I guess, for completeness sake, d phi, d phi, wouldn't I? Which is 1. A lot of times people leave that off. So for a maximum, we could say that this is equal to zero. Uh, we could graph this to figure out if it was a maximum. It would be a maximum at zero. So I go through this and, and say then that uh, we've got zero is equal to two times v naught squared divided by g times the cosine of two phi. And I could say that this is really equal to um, 0 is equal to some constant a times the cosine of 2 phi. Is that right? So there's a couple solutions. If a is equal to 0, that's kind of trivial. So the other one that I would like to look at is if the uh, cosine of 2 phi is equal to zero. Both of those would solve the equation. If that constant, what I've said, is a, so I just group this whole mess here up into a over here. If that's equal to zero, it satisfies the equation, but that would be a trivial. Uh, so the other one that we want to look at is the cosine of 2 phi as being equal to zero. So if I look at that, I'd have the uh, inverse cosine give me 90 degrees, so phi would end up being 45 degrees for maximum. So, I mean, most of you figured out this pretty early in your dirt clod throwing days and things like that, where you got maximum range by heaving it out at about a 45 degree, right? Um, if you try and throw it, throw it, throw it uh, fast, uh, flat and fast, uh, you don't get as much range. If you try and throw it directly up, it comes right back down on you. So, questions with that? So we should probably take away from this. Uh, you've got some homework problems that you can uh, practice this on. But your, your height, your time, your range, and then the notion that you get maximum range at 45 degrees. Now, this is actually what we had the first computers for was doing calculations. If you start putting uh, aerodynamic drag into this and whatnot, you, you can uh, make more realistic calculations. It becomes very important when you're doing this because the, uh, the, the military, they're going to... Uh, if you have an enemy here, so I'll draw this enemy. Okay, they're going to have. A, they're going to try and take their artillery and have it come in and and hit, and then a little further and then hit, and a little further and hit, and a little further. A rolling barrage as they go across the enemy, right? And hopefully the enemy will get down during this. And what are your troops doing during this process? Do we have any military engineers here? They're right behind you, right? Okay, so they are following you up 
on this and coming in and hopefully attacking the enemy when they are down uh, as they as the barrage went over the uh, over the top of them. So being able to calculate this and know where this is coming down so you don't shell your own people becomes fairly important. Okay. So anyway, if you go back and look at history, some of the first computers were done to do these calculations. Not this simple. If you start factoring air drag into this, they, they get a lot more complicated. Questions with that? So you've got some homework problems that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, test you on that. Let's move on a little bit. I'd like to look at a uh, slightly different type of a projectile problem. Well, I guess I guess we said that we were going to look at the... Well, when we're talking about projectiles, I wanted to uh, talk about the uh, Gastoff gun. I usually at this point put some pictures up and whatnot, but with an online format, uh, copyright is particularly tricky in regards to that. So I'll leave it to you to uh, do a quick Google search of that. Or There's even some interesting uh, YouTube videos on that. I've been always been uh, hesitant to, to play those because they're in German. I'm not real sure what they're saying. don't want to get hauled in front of the dean of students for something. Um, but the uh, the Gustav gun, and we, we may uh, look at some pictures in the uh, in the lab time that we have each week. Uh, but it, it's particularly impressive. The uh, question oftentimes come uh, comes up: What was the largest um, successful uh, gun ever made? And uh, there's been uh, several that were larger than this, but they weren't successful. This is really the only successful one: the Gustav gun made by the Germans during World War II. And uh, there were three of them built. Uh, they were used uh, particularly on the Eastern Front to pound the Russians and during some of those uh, really horrific sieges that uh, took place. Uh, the technical specifications for this gun are, are really incredible. And I'll just kind of read through these. Uh, it's a railway gun, so it's on uh, rail cars, which is kind of odd. When I think of a large gun, I would think it would be ship uh, shipborne, uh, but it's on rails. It's on two parallel rails, uh, and if you go and look at some pictures, it's a really impressive. Uh, let's look at some numbers here. It has a diameter of 800 millimeters, so that's 31.5 inches. So that's about twice the size of our uh, great big guns on our battleships, the so 16-inch guns on the battleships. Uh, it's served by a 500-man crew commanded by a major general. You'll see why they need so many people in a moment. Uh, two types of projectiles are fired using a 3,000-pound charge of smokeless powder. So, yeah, every time they pull the trigger, uh, they're uh, running 3,000 pounds of powder, gunpowder through that thing. Uh, the shells that are uh, expelled then are either a 10,500-pound high-explosive shell or a 16,500-pound concrete piercing projectile. Uh, craters from the uh, high-energy shell measured 30 feet wide by 30 feet deep, while the concrete piercing projectile proved capable of penetrating 264 feet of reinforced concrete. Now, I'm just looking at one report on that. That seems like a number that's just almost unbelievable, 264 feet of reinforced concrete. That's uh, virtually a football field thick of reinforced concrete. Um, so if you do some research on that and come up with another number, I'd be very interested in that. Uh, very interesting. If we think about range, maximum range was 29 miles for the high energy shells and 23 miles for the con concrete piercing uh, projectiles. And muzzle velocity was approximately 2,700 feet per second. So very interesting. Uh, again, apologize for not putting a picture up here because I don't have any pictures that I own and I didn't want to buy a picture, uh, but there are lots of great pictures. Uh, Gustav, I've got it spelled correctly up here. You can do a quick search on that on your own. Um, so anyway, I'll point that out and uh, leave you to, to do a little research on that very interesting uh, piece of, of history. But the next uh, projectile problem I'd like to look at is just simple drop, whether you're looking at a, a sniper firing at something or whether you're uh, dealing with the Gustav gun. When you start firing some, at something 20-some miles away, you have to deal with, with the drop of your projectile. Uh, <clears throat> recently, there's been some records set by snipers in the uh, furthest uh, confirmed kill, and, and it's usually about uh, pretty close to... 2300 meters is where they are at now. It's kind of interesting. There's an Oregon connection to this. A lot of the records recently have been set by Canadian uh, sharpshooters. There's an Oregon connection to this. Almost always they're using Leopold optics. If any of you have had a chance to look through a Leopold scope, you realize you get what you pay for. Uh, very high-end scopes, very clear. 
And they're usually, it, they'll use all kinds of uh, uh, rifles, 50 cal is pretty common, 338 uh, Lapua or something like that, but they almost always have a uh, Leopold scope on them. That's an Oregon company, it's actually a Mecop company, so somebody that go into Mecop. What do I got going here? Yes? Leopold? Uh, yeah, or maybe maybe granddaughter or something. The Leopold name's been around for a while. It would not surprise me. Yeah, they're located up, I think, up in the Tigard area. Yeah. So, uh, and they have MECOPs. So some of you that are in the uh, probably mechanical area, industrial area, may find yourself working for a few months through MECOP at uh, Leopold. So. So different records, there was one set by uh, a Marine Hatcock back in Vietnam that held for a long time and then nowadays of course how records go, they're always being broke almost daily, but most of them are around uh, 2300 meters now. And um, if we look at the velocity, we could say that the velocity is approximately 3000 feet per second. We could get into a lot more detail with that, but we'll just take it for rough numbers for about 3000 feet per second. So this 2,300 meters, if we convert this, this turns out to be about uh, 7,600 feet. How many feet in a mile? 5,280, is that right? So that's a long ways away. It's a mile and a half. Okay. So what we'd like to do is figure out the, the, uh, the drop. Obviously, if they uh, shoot uh, horizontally there, they're going to have drop from that line of sight. So we'd like to figure out what the drop is. Uh, we can calculate this with our uh, kinematics equation. We're going to say that the acceleration here is equal to g, which is, of course, a constant. And we could then say that uh, our, our old friend s is equal to s naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. And this bullet drop, if we take this at zero and take our initial velocity at zero, uh, the bullet is just dropping. So we've got then that the drop is equal to one half times the acceleration of gravity times t squared. And if you remember uh, from last time, we saw that time was equal to the square root of 2y divided by the acceleration of gravity g. So we've, we've seen something very similar to that before. Well, how long is it the, uh, the projectile, the bullet, going to be in, in flight? Well, we're going to take the acceleration in this direction as equal to zero, okay, which is probably not a very good approximation, but about the best we can do now. Um, we'll talk about the final answer in light of that. So with that being equal to zero in the horizontal direction, in the x direction, I can say that uh, distance equals rate times time, right? So the time is going to be equal to the distance divided by the rate. So I have 7,600 feet. That's my distance downrange divided by the rate of 3,000 feet per second. You can put whatever velocity you want in there, whether you're doing 50 cal or 338 Lapua or whatever, um, which this gives you 2.53 seconds. Okay. That's how long the uh, bullet's going to be in air to, to get to its target. So now I can uh, look at the drop. So if I come up and take this equation here, and I, I just pointed out that this was just a rearrangement that we saw last time. But I can say then that the drop is going to be equal to 1 half times 32.2, that's our acceleration of gravity, times 2.53 seconds squared which ends up being 103 feet, which seems like a lot. And I said, oh, did I mess up the units? I'm off by a factor of 12. Well, let's look at this. If I look at my units here, uh, the feet cancel, didn't they? And the denominator of a denominator is a numerator, so that has good units. What are my units over here? Well, the half doesn't have units, but 32.2 uh, is feet per second squared times then uh, 2.53 when you square it, it's going to be seconds squared. So indeed, it's feet. It's 103. Okay. I mean, if we were to, t to go up to a tall tower and take the, uh, the projectile of that thing and drop it over the edge such that it could fall for, what, 2.53 seconds? We'd expect the tower to have to be pretty tall, wouldn't we? 
fact, how tall would it have to be? 103 feet, wouldn't it? Okay. So the, the people that get into this business have to adjust for this, right? They're not going to be just going by line of sight. They're probably going to adjust this thing so the uh, barrel is pointing something like this and it's going to uh, come up and then come down. Anyone that's maybe sighted in their rifle for hunting or something like that recognizes there's a, a distance that you sighted in for. Are you going to sight it in for 100 yards or 200 yards or 600 yards or, or whatever that's going to be? So, <coughs> Questions with that? So what about our assumption of the acceleration in the horizontal equal to zero? Does that make this easier? Obviously easier mathematically, uh, but from a standpoint of drop, if I release that, if I say that that bullet's going to slow down, which it, it will some, not as dramatic as we might think, but it is going to slow down some as it goes down range, is that going to make the drop worse or better? Worse. Because we're saying now it's probably going to take something more than 2.53 seconds, right? Yeah. So this is ideal. In actuality, the drop's probably greater than that. Anyway, that's why people that do this, they, they practice all the time. I think a few years ago there was a, um, a pirate hostage situation, and didn't we have three Navy SEALs that made simultaneous headshots from one rocking ship to another rocking ship? And I think a couple of them shot through a window at the same time. Very difficult. Yes? Diff three different people. <laughs> three different people. So, the... Uh, because the, the other thing that we're that uh, I, I said from rocking ship to rocking ship, we haven't talk, even talked about relative velocities yet. And the other thing that we haven't talked about here is in and out of the paper, right? What do we call that? Windage? Okay. And the, 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 uh, the sad thing is sometimes here, the wind might be blowing from the, uh, the north to the south, and down here, down range, it might be going the other way, right? You have a little gust or an eddy or something like that. This can get very difficult. That's why people that are experts at this spend a lot of time practicing. Anyway, questions with that? So, calculating basic drop. Well, yes? Was it easier to like, calculate um, a gun shooting downward than shooting upward? Down, down is more difficult to do. The calculation is going to be similar in terms of the trajectory. The question was the altitude. And what altitude is that longest shot? Which altitude was what? What altitude was that longest shot taken at? Oh, I, I think that was, it was in Afghanistan. So it, w it was not from an aircraft or anything. I don't know whether, they, I suspect they were probably shooting down some, but maybe not significantly. Other questions? So the next thing we'll go to is we're going to talk about curvilinear motion. So we've been talking about things going in a straight line or trying to analyze them in a straight line. Now we want to start taking, talking about things going around a, uh, a path. So if we look at this uh, particle, let's say A, that's moving along this curved path here. And if I look at the uh, the particle at A, and then I look at the particle sometime later, delta T here, it'll be at A prime. And I could uh, take some reference system, and I could describe its position at A with the vector r, and then there would be some delta r, so then its position at uh, sometime later, its new position A prime, would be r plus delta r, right? I mean, if you take a curve and you walk around that uh, curve, this is what's going to happen. Initially, you might be at this point, and then you walk around this curve, and at some point later, you'll be there. So if we want to talk about the average velocity, that, that's pretty straightforward. It's just going to be delta r over delta t. If we want to talk about average speed, of course, speed is just the magnitude of the velocity, so it would be the magnitude of delta r over delta t, looking at the speed. If I want to talk about the instantaneous velocity, I could say that the instantaneous velocity would be equal to the limit 
as delta t goes to zero. So this brings us to the notion that we would have delta r over delta t, or taking the limit of that. So why don't I just uh, get rid of this here and say that this I'll have dr dt, which a lot of times I'll just write as r dot. Okay, so this dot up here is to differentiate with respect to time. With respect to time. Okay, so we're going to have uh, dr dt. And if I want to look at the acceleration, the instantaneous acceleration, I could say that that would be, uh, again, using the limit, I would have dv dt, right? Which I could say was equal to v dot, like that. Okay. Again, that's just a, a shorthand way of saying dv dt, which would actually be equal to what? r double dot? If I took the second derivative of r, I would get the instantaneous acceleration. Did you use that notation in physics? No, not the dots. It's fairly common in dynamics. Just a uh, just a shorthand. So, if we want to talk about rectangular coordinates, then. And really, as we go through this, we're just talking about slicing up the pie a little differently or slicing up the pizza a little differently. You can still eat the pizza, okay? Whether you make it pie-shaped or you cut it square, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes it's easier to do it one way than, than another. And we'll, we'll talk about that. We're, by doing rectangular coordinates, we're not changing the problem. We're just changing the math we use to analyze the problem. Uh, if you have something that lends itself well to rectangular coordinates and you try and do it with normal or tangential or r or theta coordinates, it's probably going to be a lot more difficult. But done properly and done carefully, you should come up with the, the same answer. Well, if I look at my rectangular coordinates, how would you describe this r vector? You'd probably describe it something like this in terms of i's and j's, where i is the unit vector in the x direction, j is the unit vector in the y direction. So we'd say we had some x value, some horizontal distance in the i direction, plus some vertical distance in the y direction. So we'd have j like that, right? And then if I wanted to talk about the velocity, which is equal to the derivative of that, I could say that that was x dot in the i direction plus y dot in the j direction. And some of you that are pretty careful with your math, pretty conscientious, might say, hey, well, you can't do that. That should really be the uh, chain rule. We should have the chain rule where we have uh, x dot times i plus x times i dot plus then the same thing for y. We would have y dot j plus y j dot. So for both of these, whether we're looking at i dot or j dot, what's that equal to? It's actually equal to zero. Yeah, that's a good bet. Because the i and j, they don't change direction, do they? This is always the i direction. It's always that way. This is always the j direction. It's always that way. So its direction is not changing. What about its magnitude? It's always 1. So what's the derivative of 1? 0, right? So because it has a magnitude of 1 and its direction doesn't change, we know that's equal to 0. So we can have some confidence in that answer there. Finally, we could do this again and say that the acceleration is equal to uh, v dot. Or if you wanted to go back to the beginning, you could say that this was r double dot, which would give you and uh, if you look at i dot being zero, then i double dot would be zero. So you're going to have x double dot in the i direction plus y double dot in the j direction. So you'd have something like that. Probably the easiest is rectangular coordinates, although we, we tend not to use them a lot because when we have curvilinear motion, oftentimes a different coordinate system is handy. Well, let's try an example of this.
So let's say we have a little uh, rocket problem here. We fire this rocket off and it, uh, it starts out here at the origin and it goes up 40 meters. Okay. So at the elevation 40 meters, at 40 meters, it starts to travel along the parabolic path. So at 40 meters, it starts traveling along that parabolic path. Okay. And we're told that the y component of the velocity is a constant 180 meters per second. That's going to be an important piece of information. Two important pieces of information. One, the magnitude being equal to 180 meters per second, and the notion that it is a constant is going to be important. So then what we'd like to do is we'd like to find the velocity and acceleration, or the magnitude of the velocity and acceleration, when y is equal to 80. So up here, when y is equal to 80 meters, we'd like to figure out what the magnitude of the velocity and the acceleration is. Okay with that? So let's see if we can do this. I'll start out with the, uh, the function there. y minus 40 quantity squared is equal to 160x. Square both, or uh, square out the uh, brackets there. So y squared minus 80y plus 40 squared. I'll just leave that as 40 squared is equal to 160x. And I think I will uh, differentiate this thing. So I'm going to differentiate with respect to t. So I'm going to have 2y. And then I'll have dy dt. We have to be careful with that because so, so often we differentiate with respect to y. And you'd have dy dy, which is 1. So we get in the sloppy habit, the bad habit of not writing that. But I'm differentiating with respect to t. So dy dt probably isn't 1. It's actually the velocity in the y direction, isn't it? Well, if I continue on, then I'll have minus 80 dy dt plus uh, 0 is equal to 160 dx dt. OK with that? So I could say, then, uh, what's dy dt? That's the velocity in the y direction, isn't it? Do we know what that is? Yeah, 180, isn't it? And likewise, this dy dt, that's 180. And this dx dt, that's the velocity in the x direction, isn't it? So I could say that the velocity in the x direction is equal to 2 times 80, and everything's in meters, so my unit should work out, times 180 minus 80 times 180. I'm just putting this into this equation here. And then I just have to divide this thing by 160. Okay. And this turns out to be equal to 90 meters per second. So if I wanted the magnitude of the velocity, which I could just write as v without the vector on it. It's really going to be 180. That was the y component squared plus the x component that we just found, 90 squared, which gives me what, uh, 201? 201 meters per second. So there's the magnitude of the velocity at 80 meters. Well, that worked well. Let me uh, come back to this expression here and differentiate again. Questions? Okay, so if I come back there and differentiate again, I'm going to have what two uh, y times the second derivative of y with respect to t plus 2 times the derivative of y with respect to t squared minus 80 times the second derivative of y 
is equal to 160 times the second derivative of x. Okay, and probably people are okay with a couple of those terms: the 160 over the or times the second derivative of x, the 80 times the second derivative of y. But then this one is probably like, where did that come from? Okay. Well, remember when we differentiated this, we were starting out with uh, 2 times y times dy dt, right? Which we have a constant 2, so that's why you see a 2 in each of those terms. And then what do you have in here? You have a product, don't you? So we have to use the product rule. So I'm going to have the uh, first term times the derivative of the second, and then I'm going to have the derivative of the first times the second product rule. Okay, so that's where that came from. Now, what is this, uh, the second derivative of y with respect to t? That's really the acceleration in the y direction, isn't it? This is the velocity in the y direction. This is the acceleration in the y direction. And this is the acceleration in the x direction, isn't it? What do we know about the acceleration in the y direction? Yeah, because this is constant, this is where you have to really suck all the meaning out of this, right? I mean, it's like reading your poetry in your English class. You could read it syllable by syllable and not get anything out of it. You had to step back half a step and look at this thing. When they say that the velocity is constant, what are they really telling you? They're screaming at you that the acceleration in the y direction is equal to zero. Now, it would been a lot less uh, hassle. It would have taken a lot less ink to just write that, but we want you to, to pull that out. If it's got constant velocity, acceleration is equal to zero. So I have zero plus two times the velocity, which is 180 squared minus zero is equal to 160 times the acceleration in the x direction. <clears throat> so we should be able to solve for the acceleration in the x direction. That would be equal to uh, 2 times 180 squared divided by 160. What's that turn out to be? Make sure that's right. Yeah, 405 meters per second squared. Now, for completeness sake, we could say that the uh, magnitude of the acceleration, which I could just say was the acceleration, that's going to be the square root of the acceleration in the x direction squared plus the acceleration in the y direction squared. Well, the acceleration in the y direction is zero, so this is really also going to just be 405 meters per second squared, isn't it? Because that one is zero. Well, let's see. What's our we're metric? So the acceleration of gravity, g, um, assuming that we're fairly close to the Earth, which I guess we are if we're measuring from the Earth at 80 meters. So g is probably going to be pretty close to 10 meters per second squared. So this would be about what? 40 g. So what can we say about the rocket? It's either unmanned or it will soon be unmanned, right? Yeah. How much acceleration can you take? 13, 10, 11. Uh, I mean, a, a well-trained pilot with a G-suit on is probably going to be able to, to go up into the nines, maybe, eight, seven, eight, nine. Uh, beyond that, they're, they're definitely going to black out. The general public without a G suit, uh, not very much. Okay, that's one of the the challenges for amusement park rides is to give you a really good ride, but not to kill grandma that's got a heart condition with the acceleration, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, well, for instance, if you go into a hard dive and come back up, the way the G suit works is your blood's going to try and pool in your feet, so it actually just squeezes your legs. So. Well, the uh, 
The next place we're going to go is we're going to look at normal and tangential coordinates. So that's a little more, more complicated because all of a sudden our coordinate directions are changing. Uh, for instance, the normal direction always points to the radius of uh, the center of curvature. Uh, if I look at something like this, I would have a tangential direction here and the normal direction uh, there. So the directions are always changing, and that's going to have some, some more complicated implications, although this is a good tool. We'll, we'll use it a lot. Well, thank you for watching, and uh, take care until next time.